Welcome to lecture number six. Today we will explore the major causes of the American Revolution, which resulted in the independence of the United States in 1783. This lecture will address several themes. First, it will explore the roots of the French and Indian War and show how tension developed between the English and the colonists after the war. Secondly, the lecture will investigate the series of policies adopted by Parliament which led to this tension. Finally, it will trace some of the important events and battles which took place during the Revolutionary War. We'll begin with the concept of European rivalry and background to the French and Indian War. As you can see from this list below, the colonial era is characterized by a great deal of warfare. These were world wars. Fighting took place not only in North America, but on other continents. The wars primarily involved England and France as they fought over control of North America, but Spain was also involved. This map identifies the regions occupied by the French, Spanish, and British as of about 1750. Notice the vast purple area on the map indicating areas under the influence of the French. As the 18th century continued, British and French spheres of influence came into conflict with one another, which led to warfare. The first segment of this lecture will address most of its focus on what was clearly the most important of these wars, the French and Indian War, as well as the competing claims of both the French and English in North America. This slide was originally shown in lecture number two. French claims to North America began with the explorations of Jacques Cartier. In the 1530s, he explored the St. Lawrence River and sailed to what is now Montreal. This slide, also from Lecture 2, chronicles the actions of Samuel Champlain, the father of New France, who had a tremendous influence on the fur trade. We'll now identify two additional Frenchmen whose actions added to French claims in North America. The first of these Frenchmen would be the explorer Robert de La Salle. In 1682, he paddled the full length of the Mississippi River, claiming it for the French crown. Once he reached what is now New Orleans, he named the entire region Louisiana, in honor of his king, Louis XIV. The arrows on this map point to different segments of the Mississippi River. He wasn't the first Frenchman to travel down the river. Louis Joliet and the missionary Pierre Marquette traveled as far south as Arkansas, but they went no further. La Salle was important because he traveled the entire distance of the river. The other important individual was Antoine Cadillac. He came to New France at the age of 25 and was involved with the fur trade. He was important because he founded the city of Detroit in 1701. The actions of these two men served to enhance French claims to the interior of North America. The arrow here points to Cadillac's Detroit. While you can clearly see in this map that the French had an area of influence which was quite large, the population of the French in North America paled in comparison to that of Britain's. Britain's demographic advantage in North America was quite clear. In 1700 there were approximately 15,000 French colonists living in North America as opposed to about 250,000 non-Indians living in England's colonies. By the middle of the century, there was a dramatic increase in the number of French colonials. They had quadrupled in numbers. However, the British advantage was reinforced during the same era as the number of colonists increased to about 1.17 million. A great deal of time has already been spent in previous lectures chronicling the early histories of several English colonies. However, there's one characteristic which might be interesting that addresses the changing nature of colonial populations over the course of the 18th century. As you can see from these charts, in 1700, English and Welsh settlers made up 80% of the population, while by 1755, it was barely a majority. This came about due to a heavy increase in the number of German and Irish immigrants and a doubling in the size of immigrants from Africa. We'll now investigate some of the specific events associated with what was known in the colonies as the French and Indian War. A good place to start is with the simple definition of terms. 
Fighting in the French and Indian War began in 1754, and the war ended in 1763. It involved the French and their Indian allies fighting against the British and their Indian allies. In Europe, the war was called the Seven Years' War. Now, you may be saying to yourself, why in the world was it called that? The war lasted for nine years. Well, fighting started in North America in 1754 and spread to Europe by 1756. Overall, the war ended with a peace treaty which was signed in 1763. To be honest, I didn't name the war. I'm only here to talk about it. The first battle took place at Fort Duquesne in the hotly contested Ohio Valley during the summer of 1754. Fort Duquesne was located at the confluence of three rivers near modern-day Pittsburgh. It was strategically significant as the river systems were the highways of the 18th century and control over this location would facilitate influence over the entire Ohio Valley. The valley itself was significant as colonists, the French, members of the Iroquois Confederacy, and Indians already living in the region, each had competing claims to the area which was rich in hunting lands and fertile soil. A young officer from Virginia attempted to force the French to leave the area in 1754 and was forced to surrender. The young officer was George Washington, and he surrendered, ironically, on July 4th. The next year, the British responded by sending experienced General Edward Braddock to the colonies, who led a force of over 2,000, which included British regulars as well as Virginians, against the French at Fort Duquesne. This resulted in a humiliating defeat for Braddock and his forces. Braddock himself lost his life. The first years of the war went poorly for the British, but fortunes changed over time. One turning point was seen with the successful siege of the French fort of Louisbourg in 1758. The victory at Louisburg was strategically important as it gave the British control over the Gulf of St. Lawrence as shown by the arrow on this map. Thereafter, it was difficult for the French to transport supplies to Canada. Following a stunning attack on the Plains of Abraham by British General James Wolfe, Quebec fell to the British in 1759 as depicted in part by this image on the left. After the fall of Quebec to British forces, France's defeat in North America seemed to be certain. However, fighting did continue in Europe and other parts of the world. A peace treaty was eventually signed by all parties in 1763. The French were hurt by the fact that they were outnumbered so dramatically by the English colonists. However, their efforts were also damaged by the changing alliances involving Indians. For decades, Native Americans, particularly the Iroquois, were successful diplomats who played European powers off against one another. Up to 1758, there was a tendency to side with the French, but things changed in that year. The Iroquois accurately judged the balance of power was shifting toward the British and made sure they were on the winning side. The image from an American magazine shows an undecided Indian warrior in between a Frenchman and Englishman, each offering presents. The message, whomever offers the better gift, will receive the assistance of Native Americans in the Ohio Valley. In many ways, 1763 is a turning point in American history because this was the year in which the peace treaty ending the French and Indian War was signed. It was important because one of the most important results of the war was that France lost almost its entire overseas empire. Here we are, back to that map of North America at about 1750. The purple sections indicate areas controlled by the French before the French and Indian War. 
there is very little purple on this map showing spheres of influence after 1763. Neither the French nor British wanted the other to control Louisiana, so this was ceded to Spain in 1762. The British clearly emerged as the dominant European power in North America. Practically overnight, Canadian citizens, a large majority of whom spoke French and were Roman Catholic, became subjects of England rather than France. The French cultural heritage is still seen today primarily in eastern provinces like Quebec. Finally, Native Americans also became big losers as they lost the ability to play different European powers off against one another. Next, we will investigate some of the steps which led to increased tension between the colonists in the Americas and England. With the defeat of the French, there was a tremendous surge of patriotism and pride by 1763. However, within a relatively short period of time, there was an incredible rift between the colonists and the home country of England. The image on the right seems to embody the emotions associated with this rift. There were two major factors which influenced this shift in attitude among the Americans. First, the British established the Proclamation Line. This was a boundary beyond which colonists were prohibited from settling. The Proclamation Line, shown in black and outlined with red arrows, roughly followed the Appalachian Mountain Range. The British wanted to temporarily halt colonial expansion westward to prevent bloodshed between settlers and Indians. This was incredibly unpopular in the colonies. The second factor which hurt relations was the large national debt which came about as a result of the French and Indian War. As far as many in England were concerned, the war had started in the colonies, it benefited the colonies, now the colonies were going to have to help pay for it. The Stamp Act was not the first piece of legislation designed to increase revenues, but it proved to be the most important. First, it required all legal documents, such as marriage licenses, wills, diplomas, and others, be printed on specially marked paper, which included the government stamp. Secondly, it required many other items, such as newspapers, pamphlets, and even playing cards, also be printed with this special paper. Opposition to the Stamp Act was widespread. Here we see a Boston crowd burning bundles of the special watermarked paper intended for use as stamps. Officials in Parliament believed the tax was fair as people in Britain had been paying a similar tax for years. Americans countered by arguing this was a direct tax rather than an external tax on something like trade. Colonial assemblies already taxed the colonists. A final provision of the Stamp Act seemed to attack certain privileges and rights held by British subjects for years. Those accused of a crime were not granted a jury trial. Judges determined their guilt or innocence. Furthermore, it was assumed that defendants were guilty of a crime and had to prove their innocence, rather than having the burden of proof rest in the hands of the prosecution. Orators like Patrick Henry led the fight against the Stamp Act. In the fall of 1765, representatives from nine colonies met in New York in the Stamp Act Congress. An attempt at colonial unity had been attempted during the French and Indian War, yet it had ended in failure. In a surprising show of unity, the colonies agreed to statements arguing the Parliament had no right to issue such taxes. In many colonies, would-be stamp distributors were intimidated into resigning their commissions as they faced threats of violence against their persons or property. The image here shows how one organization, the Sons of Liberty, led in Boston by Samuel Adams, used one method to intimidate people into coming to their point of view. On the eve of the Stamp Act's implementation, several merchants, beginning with some in New York, threatened to boycott the purchase of all British goods. This would have the potential to negatively impact Britain's economy. So in March of the next year, Parliament repealed the Stamp Act while declaring at the same time its right to pass legislation concerning the colonies as it saw fit.
protests on the part of the colonists ended once Parliament repealed the Stamp Act. However, members were still faced with the prospect of a large debt. So, in 1767, Parliament passed the Townshend Duties. These placed a new series of taxes on items such as glass, white lead, paper and tea, imported from Great Britain. Worse yet, the revenues from this act were to be set aside to fund the salaries of colonial governors. This act threatened the power of elected assemblies because the colonists previously had control over governor salaries. Boycotts, which had been effective during the Stamp Act crisis, were re-established. The collective action was effective, and supporters of the colonists in Parliament succeeded in obtaining a repeal of the Townshend duties on all items save one. The tax on tea remained. As a result, many colonists refused to drink tea or defied the law by obtaining tea which had been smuggled. Additionally, 4,000 troops were sent to Boston, a hotbed of anti-British sentiment, to restore law and order. Bostonians resented the presence of the British, and tension between the two groups led to a clash in March of 1770. It began when a crowd started throwing snowballs at a squad of soldiers, taunting them. It ended after shots were fired at the crowd and five died. This event was called the Boston Massacre. I've toured the site of the Boston Massacre along Boston's Freedom Trail. It's really cool to walk through this area and see the sights for yourself. If you can make the trip, I highly recommend it. You may click on the hyperlink below to find more information about the Boston Massacre and its importance to American history. The Crown and members of Parliament were shocked at the violence. Colonists treated the victims of the Boston Massacre as martyrs. Some in the colonies also reacted by establishing what were called Committees of Correspondence. Once again, Sam Adams emerged as an important force behind this movement. It encouraged the exchange of information and methods to coordinate opposition to policies adopted by the British. We were beginning to see additional unity among the colonies. In 1773, Parliament tried to undermine colonial resolve by passing the Tea Act. This would have placed a tax on tea, yet it also allowed the East India Tea Company a monopoly. By doing so, this would have lowered the price of tea to the colonists. However, the people in the colonies saw through this ruse. An interesting response was undertaken in Boston. Members of the Sons of Liberty dumped over 300 chests of tea into Boston's harbor in December of 1773. This incident was known as the Boston Tea Party. Reaction to the Boston Tea Party was swift and strong. In 1774, Parliament passed the Intolerable Acts. Among other things, they closed the port of Boston and made the colony's government much less democratic. In response to these actions, representatives from every colony, with the exception of Georgia, met in Philadelphia for the First Continental Congress. There, delegates agreed to cease exporting all goods to Britain and voted to boycott all British products. men and women became involved in these anti-English activities. Many attended meetings and pledged their support of the boycotts. However, the author of this cartoon chose to satirize one event as an unruly tea party. These Daughters of Liberty also became involved in spinning bees in hopes of ending dependence on imported cloth. The first battles of the Revolutionary War took place in April of 1775 at Lexington and Concord. They began when British troops were sent to seize control over military supplies stored in the area. Colonists were warned by Paul Revere and William Dawes that the British were coming. Eight Minutemen were killed at Lexington, and then the British moved on to Concord. There, they were turned back as they suffered nearly 300 casualties. Fighting in the War for American Independence had begun. Even though hostilities had started between the Americans and the Crown, ties still bound the colonists to the home country. For some, a final straw came in the form of a pamphlet published in January of 1776.
Thomas Paine had arrived in the colonies only two years prior to 1776, yet the goal with his work, Common Sense, was to influence public opinion to support a break with the king. He argued that all monarchies were corrupt and evil. He advocated the Americans break away from England's monarchy and establish a republic where power was held by the people. It was simple, common sense, that the colonists should break its ties to what was clearly a corrupt system of government. His work went on to be a bestseller, and it was incredibly influential and written in such a way as to connect with common people. For more information about pain and common sense, you may click on the hyperlink below. In July of 1776, members of the Continental Congress met and considered a proposal calling for the independence of the American colonies. Thomas Jefferson was given the primary task of writing the formal declaration. On July 4th of that year, Jefferson's document was formally approved by a vote of the Congress. When the text of the declaration was read aloud in New York, crowds tore down this statue of King George III. You may click on the hyperlink below to the entire text of the Declaration of Independence. We can now explore the opposing sides in the War for American Independence. It appeared as if the colonists had no chance to win this war. First, they were hopelessly outnumbered by about 7.5 million to 2.5 million, many of whom were enslaved. The British also had the world's largest navy and possibly the strongest army. They even had enough resources to hire foreign troops, which they did. There were also large numbers of colonists opposed to the independence movement. These loyalists were estimated to make up as much as 20% of the white population of the colonies. Their support was strongest in New York and New Jersey. On the side, we see an image of England's King George III. Americans were helped by strong and committed leadership. Virginia's George Washington was named the head of the Continental Army. He became a true hero of the Revolution. Benjamin Franklin worked as a diplomat, attempting to secure foreign aid. While the Americans didn't have a large cadre of well-trained soldiers, they were fighting for a noble cause, the independence of their country. However, the colonists were plagued by a lack of unity, economic difficulties, and they always seemed to be short on supplies. This slide shows Washington at his winter quarters at Valley Forge. Washington and his men suffered from inadequate food, supplies, firewood, and shelter in their winter encampment. Soldiers often walked barefoot and wore ragged clothing. The colonists were helped by the fact that they were primarily fighting a defensive war. While they were loyalists in the colonies, there was also a vocal minority in England and Parliament in support of their cause. If they could only extend the fighting until the British public lost patience in the fighting, they would improve their odds of victory. There were several important battles which took place during the war. We'll now explore a few of those. Early fighting in the North focused on New York. By the end of 1776, Washington was forced to retreat following the capture or death of about a quarter of his soldiers. However, Washington then surprised a group of Hessian forces in Trenton by mobilizing his troops on Christmas night and attacking. This was followed by a victory at Princeton in early January 1777. Here we see a map of the major fighting which took place in the north. The purple arrow points to the locations of Washington's victories in Trenton and Princeton. A crucial strategic victory was won in the fall of 1777 when nearly 6,000 British troops surrendered at Saratoga. This was important because soon thereafter, France formally recognized the United States. The arrow here points to Saratoga. It's really difficult to overestimate the significance of this victory in the French alliance. It was important for morale, and the involvement of the French proved to be key for the Americans. In the West, campaigns tended not to involve large troop mobilizations. Native Americans were also heavily active, often fighting for the British. 
Mohawk Chief Joseph Brant led many forays into both Pennsylvania and New York. The entrance of Brant into the fighting led to the collapse of the Iroquois Confederacy. Initially, the Iroquois pledged to remain neutral, but Brant fought against the colonists because he believed the British would be more likely to prevent American expansion westward. Here we see a map identifying several battles showing the war in the West. If you look at the circled area, it identifies the actions of the frontiersman George Rogers Clark. In late 1778 and early 79, he successfully attacked a series of scattered forts with a small number of men in the crucial Ohio Valley. Beginning in 1778 and 79, the British adopted a strategy to focus their efforts on the South. They succeeded with attacks in Georgia and South Carolina in those years. While these were successful, they were never able to successfully control the entire regions they occupied. General Nathaniel Greene assumed command in the South, establishing a lenient policy toward Loyalists and attempting to encourage Native Americans to remain neutral. The decisive Battle of the War took place at Yorktown. British troops, led by Cornwallis, became trapped between Washington's forces, which had traveled southward from New York City, and the French Navy in the Chesapeake. Cornwallis surrendered his entire force on October 19, 1781. Fighting continued for more than a year following the defeat, but Yorktown became important because it broke the British will to fight. One of the keys to the American victory was the participation by the French in the war following the diplomatic efforts led by Benjamin Franklin and others. The French held no love for the British, and while they hoped an independent United States might be a weak power they could control, their navy and troops were keys to the American victory at Yorktown. This image shows the brilliant young General Lafayette, who served as an aide to General Washington, but also led a group of forces at Yorktown. Now that we've completed the primary arguments included in this lecture, we can review some of its main points. Following the defeat of the French in the French and Indian War, there was tremendous patriotism on the part of the colonists. However, the British then developed a series of policies designed in large part because of their huge debt, which strained relations with the colonies. By 1775, fighting had begun at Lexington and Concord, and the major engagements continued until the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. What you should be able to do is to determine what you believe to be the most important policies and responses by the colonists, which led to the Revolutionary War. This concludes lecture number six. I hope you have a great day. The next few slides will offer some websites for additional information, as well as sources used for this presentation. Take care.